And the answer is, yes, I love Jesus, but I love my Pope too. Jesus never drank alcohol. Yeah, but you know, as long as I love Jesus, it doesn't matter if I drink a little alcohol. You know, and many such examples. Jesus fell on his face and he prayed. How do you pray? I fall on my knees and I pray. And I fold my hands like this. I don't follow his sunnah in prayer. But I still love Jesus. The way the Christians depict Isa Islam in the, in the pictures, in the images, he has a long flowing beard. So you ask him, look, you love the person, you love this personality, and one of the signs of love is imitation. As we see many people, when they love a film star or a sports star, then they try to mold themselves in their idol's image. Right or wrong? So we ask them, you know, you have portrayed Jesus with a long flowing robe and you know, a long beard, but we don't see you dressing like that or your face, you, you get up each morning and you shave till your skin peels off, but you don't want to look like Jesus. Yeah, you know, these external things are not required really to, you know, express your love. So this is the state of the Christians. And when we mention this, we look at, we think to ourselves within our minds, yes, you know, they have gone astray, you know, they are a little more perfect, uh, what is the wrong thing? Yeah, the ones who have gone astray, Allah has mentioned that. So, you know, no big deal. Alhamdulillah, I am a Muslim. Okay, brother, you are a Muslim, mashallah. And I love the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. So, brother, the uh, uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, grow your beard and clip your mustaches and, you know, be different from the Yahud and the Nasar, from the Yahud especially, and fire worshippers. Yeah, but it's only a sunnah. It's not far. But uh, if you ask a proper scholar of hadith, he will tell you that a command in a hadith where it says grow your beard, then it necessitates or it's an obligation. So it's part. And shaving, it is the consensus of all the scholars of the Ummah, including the four Malahi, that shaving is resembling the woman and it is haram. No brother, you know you are getting extreme. It's only a sunnah. Brother, the Prophet said, if the Iza, the Lord God, hangs below the ankle, then that portion which is below the ankle will burn in the hellfire in the afterlife, in the afterlife. Yeah, but you know, it's not like that, it's like this, you know, it's, I, I hold it for the Salah. You know, when I come to the Masjid, I hold it, when I go out, I the first thing I do. It's alright. And no big deal. And you guys, you know, you, you mutawas, you guys with the beards, and you, you guys, uh, the khatib, you are hung up on all the small issues. You know, the Ummah is facing such big problems, and you are worried about the beard, you are worried about the Islam. Brother, if you can't do these small, minor things, how are you going to sacrifice the bigger things? Your wealth, your life. And surely Allah is going to try you with all of that in this life. Paradise is not going to be handed to us on a platter. But we still love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa A person, you tell him that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi said, the difference between us and the non-Muslims is the salah. Oh yes, brother, you are right. I pray every Jummah. I come from the Salat of Jummah, I pray. But of course, there are some who don't even pray that on Jummah. They are sleeping. But, they carry a lighting, it says he is a Muslim. And he is no less a Muslim than a person who might be praying five times a day, following the, the, the deen. Yeah. But, he professes love for the Prophet And how does he manifest that love? 
by imitating the Jews and the Christians. The Jews, uh, the Christians have taken 25th of December as a day for the celebration of the so-called birthday of Prophet Isa alayhi salam. So the Muslims have also taken a day, the 12th of Rabi'ul Awal, as the day of the celebration of the birthday of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And on one, and that one day they come out and they so-called express their love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and through different means and we we'll see that in detail in the later whether those are acceptable celebrations or not. And then they go back to life. You know, they have a holiday nowadays, mashallah. And after that, it's back to normal. So we shall see, based on the ayah that I recited, that is this the way of the Prophet and his companions. And lots of brothers, in our, my discussion with some of them, they come up and they ask me, Brother, every group nowadays, there are so many groups and so many people coming and claiming our way is the right way. We are following the Quran and the Sunnah. We are following the Quran and the Sunnah. It's very confusing for us. Which group should we follow? Any group, any individual, including myself or any of the things here or anybody who comes and tells you, Brother, do this. This is part of the being. Then the easiest and simplest way to judge whether this is part of the deen or not, is take it back to the Prophet and his companions and see if they did this act. Were they doing this? If they were doing this, then rush to do that. If they did not do it, then it should suffice you that what was Islam for them is enough of Islam for us. There is so much from the Sunnah to follow that we don't have to invent any new ways to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshaAllah. So the reason I have chosen this ayah of the Quran to begin my address to you today is because we are living in times we are, where we are searching for alternate means other than the Quran and the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to express our love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for us, the perfect religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not seem to be enough and we seem to come up with new ways of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran, Al Yawba Akmatu Lakum Dinakum, wa Akmatu Alaikum Nyamuti, wa Raditu Lakum Islam Adina. This day have I perfected your religion for you and completed my favor upon you and have chosen for you as religion as Al Islam. So two points to be noted here, Islam has been completed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has been perfected. So what is perfect cannot be improved upon, what is complete cannot be added to. You cannot add to something that is already full, it's complete, there is no room for more. So we see that it is incumbent upon all Muslims to follow the Prophet in all matters and his example is the best example as Allah has mentioned in the Quran لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا He is the best example for you followed by that of his companions we also find the Prophet warning us about innovating new ways into this pure being revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is collected in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim that Aisha radiallahu and had reported the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying Man arrata fi amrina hadha ma laysa fihi fa huwa raddun Whoever doesn't act which is not in the religion that deed is rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So one such example in recent times is the celebration of our Prophet, Noble Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muslims have turned this day into an Eid and innovated its various celebrations and forms of worship for this occasion, claiming these acts to be an expression of the love of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So today we shall try to take a brief look at the origin and history of this practice and we shall know from it the reality of this celebration which in turn shall guide us inshallah to do the right thing. In our times, some might label us as hardliners or even being disrespectful to the Prophet by not celebrating the birthday. May Allah save us from ever being disrespectful, uh, disrespectful to the Prophet But then we should rejoice in the glad tidings of the ayah I began my khutbah with where Allah SWT is saying that only those who follow the way of Prophet are rightly guided, are on the way. And if the entire world follows a different way, then they are the ones in opposition, in the schism, or of the straight path. Now, traditionally, Islamic scholars have differed over the date of 12th Rabi'u Awal, being the date of birth of the Prophet. The other dates suggested are the 10th and 13th of Rabi'ul Awal. And some scholars have even suggested the 8th. But the majority of scholars view the 9th of Rabi'ul Awal as the most authentic. Shaykh Safiur Rahman Barakuri, in his famous book of Sirah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of Rahik al Maktoum, which won a lot of prizes, which was judged by a lot of scholars for, the, for its authenticity and you know, for the you know, uh, research that they did. He states that the 9th of Rabiul Awal is the day of birth of the Prophet So, the 12th of Rabiul Awal, the date itself is in dispute. And traditionally in the past, there has never been universally, universally accepted by the scholars as being the date of birth of the Prophet Going further, we find in various historical records, Maulid al Nawi, as it is also called, was introduced by Fatimid rulers in the 4th century of Islam. Which century? 4th century. 100 years, 200 years, 300 years have passed, and this was not celebrated. In the 4th century, Then, in between, this practice was stopped by some rulers who came in and who were trying to follow the Sunnah, they did not do this again. But then, the next person to do this after them and reintroduce it was King al muzaffar Abu Sayyid Kaukaburi, the king of Irbil, which is in Iraq, at the end of the 6th century or the beginning of the 7th century. So again, you have a gap of two to three hundred years where this wasn't celebrated, this wasn't done. As was mentioned by the historian such as Ibn Khalqan, may Allah have mercy upon him and others. Abu Shama, may Allah have mercy upon him, said the first person to do that in Mosul was Sheikh Omar ibn Muhammad al mala one of the well-known righteous people. Then the ruler of Irbil and others followed his example. So this is one of the historians was recording this. Imam Ibn Kathir, Imam Allah says, in the biography of Abu Sayyid Kaukaburi, he used to observe the Maulid in Rabi al Awal and hold a huge celebration on that occasion. Some of those who were present at the feast of Abu Zafar on some occasions of the Maulid said that he used to offer in the feast, just listen, he used to offer in the feast. 5,000 grilled heads of sheep, 10,000 chickens, and 100,000 large dishes and 30 trays of sweets. He would let the Sufis sing from Zohar until Fajr, and he himself would dance with them. This is not me saying it. This is Imam Ibn Kafir saying in his record. Ibn Khalqan said, when it is the first of Safar, they decorate those domes, by the way, Safar is one of the months of the calendar. Unfortunately, we only know January, February. We don't know Safar, Rabi Lawal, Rabi Thani. Yeah. So Safar is one of the months of, of the Islamic calendar. And they, he says, 
when, when it is the first of summer, they decorate those domes with various kinds of fancy adornments. And in every dome, there sits a group of singers and a group of puppeteers and players of musical instruments. And they do not leave any of those domes without setting up a group of performers there. The people give up work during this period and they do no work except for going around and watching the entertainment. When there are two days to go until the moment, they bring out a large number of camels, cows and sheep, more than can be described, and they accompany them with all the drums, songs and musical instruments that they have until they bring them to the square, which is the central area, on the night of the Maulid and there are performance of Anasi after Maulid in this area. So you can see how Islamic the celebrations were. In the Britannica Encyclopedia, it says, the first public celebrations by Sunnis took place in 12th century Syria under the rule of Nur al-Din. Though there is no firm evidence to indicate the reason for this festival which was primarily first originated by the Shias, some theorize the celebration took hold to counter Christian influence in places such as Spain and Morocco. The practice was briefly halted by the Hajibites when they came to power. And we can see this is telling with what we read earlier about you know, the origin of this practice in the 4th century, then reintroduced in the 6th or 7th century. And it became even con an event confined to family circles. So the Ayubites, this was a clan of rulers, they stopped this practice. It regained status as an official event again in 1207 of the Christian era when it was reintroduced by Muzaffar al-Din, the brother-in-law of Salahuddin in Irbil, a town near Mosul, Iraq. So there is some conflict in who actually initiated, but the dates are more or less matching. The practice then spread throughout the Muslim world, assim assimilating local customs to places such as Cairo, where folklore and Sufi practices greatly influenced the celebrations. In the Encyclopedia of Islam, it says, by 1588, it had spread to the court of Murad III, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, the Uthmani Khilafah that was in Turkey. In 1910, it was given official status as a national festival throughout the Ottoman Empire. And today, it is an official holiday in many parts of the world. So we can see dear brothers and sisters in Islam. This is the origin of the celebration on the occasion of the Prophet's birthday. More recently, idle entertainment, extravagance and wastage of money and time have become associated with an innovation which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not sent down any authority for. Loving the Prophet is one of the tenets of belief. No Muslim can deny that. And as it is recorded in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet said, I swear to him in whose hand my soul is. Follow me, that's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. Allah is of forgiving, most merciful. So it is a commandment, it is a requirement for a Muslim to love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, and to follow him. But this love cannot be perfected unless it leads a person to follow and obey the Prophet ﷺ. This love is confirmed when one gives preference to the love of the Prophet ﷺ over the love of anything or anyone else. So this love 
is manifested not by following our own desires, not by following one mother blindly. You tell the brother, brother, this is the way for the salah, this is the hadith. That the imams, they were scholars, they didn't know and you know. We will, we in our mother, we don't pray like that. We pray like this. And this applies especially when conflict arises between obeying the Prophet and someone else or something else which is beloved to a person. If a person in this situation were to give preference to the love and obedience of the Prophet or all other objects that are beloved to them, then this would be an indication of the sincerity of their love to the Prophet. So when the evidence comes to us that this is the practice of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Brother, this is the hadith of Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would do Rafael Rafa then, when he would make Salah. Yeah, but none of the Surely the scholars must have had some evidence to do that. Yes, but this is the practice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Sahaba say, we used to do this. Yeah, but you know, and so on and so forth. It's just one example. So there is no way of loving the Prophet except through obedience to him. And except through following and imitating him. The Sahaba, they would love the Prophet and all of us would agree that none love the Prophet more than the Sahaba. So if he grew long hair up to the shoulders, they would grow long hair. If he cut it short, they would cut it short. If he wore a ring on his finger, they would wear a ring on his finger. By the way, silver, not gold. It is haram for the man to wear gold. When he took it off, they took it off. Very famous example of Abdul Ali Muhammad. He was so, he would rush to for, imitate the Prophet in most of the things. But who are we imitating nowadays? Who are we following? Who do we dress like? Who do we look like? Whose style, whose lifestyle do we follow? And no for sure that that is a manifestation of your love for that particular individual, that particular way of life. So the companions of the Prophet ﷺ achieved perfection in following, imitating and, and loving the Prophet ﷺ. And one of the best of them was Abu Bakr but yet, we don't find them celebrating the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu And none of them considered this as a sign of expressing their love. Strange, isn't it? al Maulid is, is claimed to be the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu and this term also refers to the festivals held in celebration of this event, where joy and happiness are expressed. And these events usually consist of the preparation of food, reading of books written particularly for this event, the mentioning of the good qualities of the Prophet his miracles, his family members and their virtues. And in some countries, music, singing and dancing are also included as a part of the celebration. Therefore, in summary, these events include a description of the life of the Prophet and all the events so-called narrated that happened during the birth, such as the fire of the fire worshippers going out and the balconies of the Persian rulers, palaces falling down and things like that. But 
these are all based on very very weak narrations except for one narration where the mother of uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that she saw a light coming from the way of Jordan and she was told that she would be carrying this light uh, within her in the form of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that's about it, that's the only authentic narration which is associated, uh, which we can associate as a miracle of the birth, for the birth of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but all the other narrations which talk of extraordinary events are based on very weak chains of Hadith and are not authentic in fact, as graded by the scholars of Hadith, not by me. <coughs> A point to note here is that the Hijrah of the Prophet was a great event in the history of the Muslim nation, and due to it, or rather due to it being the first step in the establishment of the first Islamic state, because this is where Prophet migrated from Makkah to Medina and then set up the Islamic State and then, you know, this is where, from where the uh, Islamic State spread across Arabia and all other parts of the world. And this is why the Quraysh also struggled hard to stop the establishment of the state. But as you can see from our history, that this event carried more weight in the Sahaba than the birthday of the Prophet And how do we know this? That Umar bin al when they wanted to set up an Islamic calendar during his Khilafah, he gave the rest of the companions two, two events to choose from. One was the actual date of the Prophethood when the Prophet was given the Prophethood. He lived for 40 years without being appointed as a prophet. So they said either this event is such a major event that we start our Islamic calendar from this day. This is date zero. Or we start from the day when the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Makkah to Medina because this is where really Islam gained strength and you know spread from. So that we will consider the day of the Prophet ﷺ coming to Medina as the day zero for our Islamic calendar. And as we know, our calendar is called the Hijri calendar based on the selection of the Sahaba of the event of the Hijrah at the beginning. Why did they not choose the birthday of the Prophet as the day of our calendar? So, None of the companions celebrated this birthday or its anniversary. Nor did they introduce any new forms of worship to remind themselves of these days. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ understood the real meaning of being his followers. They were unique. They, they were a unique generation whom the Prophet ﷺ personally raised and instructed in adherence to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa and they did not add one bit into the religion of Islam. Therefore, after knowing all of this, who can claim to be a better follower and have more love for the Prophet than his own companions? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahabihi wa man istanna bi sunnati ila yawmuddin The fact that many people in different countries take part in a bid'ah can never be taken as evidence to justify it and make it Islamically purpose. Because the truth is not related to the numbers who adhere to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anam, Ayah number 116 And if you obey most of those on the earth, they will mislead you far away from Allah's path. They follow nothing but their own desires and conjectures. And they do nothing but lie. Verily, your Lord it is who knows best 
who strays from his way and he knows best the rightly guided ones. So Islam is not about the numbers game. How many billion are following this particular way? And that is why in the Quran you will find that Ibrahim he was an individual, one person, but he is called an Ummah, a nation, whereas all the people around him were following a different way. But this way was not the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is the nation and they are all astray. So even today, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in the Quran, is that if you follow the people, then they will mislead you from the way of Allah. So don't follow the scholar, this chair, this person, myself. If I say something, check in the Quran, check in the Ahadi, check the tafsir of the scholars in the past. But the argument is, we can't understand the Quran and Hadith. This is a fitna. If you start reading the Quran, Hadith and Tafsir, it's a fitna. And this will lead you astray. Allah SWT says in the Quran that we have revealed an Arabic Quran which is easy to understand. Is there someone to reflect on it? Allah calls the Quran Hudalil Nas Guidance for mankind Not guidance for scholars only. So we have also taken the easy path. We say okay let the selected group of you know people who so-called renounce the world, stay away from the worldly affairs. They don't want to make money, they will come and leave the salah, they will make the khutbahs, they will read the books of uh, tafsir. We will be busy outside making money. We will make, we will be busy achieving the dunya. Akhirah will see when we come to it. You know, this is like a person jumping out of a plane without a parachute and he says, I don't need a parachute. When I touch the ground, I'll see what happens. If you don't prepare for the Akhara today, for sure you're going to have a crash landing on that day. So, read the Quran. You have authentic translations. You have authentic translations of the Ahadith. You have authentic translations of the Tafsir of the Quran, but we don't have the time and we don't want to make the effort. More than the time is the effort involved. Who has time and who wants to make the effort? But if you tell the same people that you know, if you do this course or that course and you, your income will increase by thousand dirhams a month, I am willing to put in five extra hours, go to college in the evening, after work. But I want paradise with all the rivers flowing underneath and the jewels and the food and the women, all of that, but I don't want to make effort. It will come to me on a platter. That's what I'm expecting, unfortunately. So dear brothers and sisters, the truth is not to be judged by the people. Rather the people are to be judged by the truth. And what is the truth? It is the Quran and the Sunnah. These are the two authentic sources in Islam. And this is a unique concept in Islam where the two sources have been preserved by Allah SWT based on His promise in the Quran. No other philosophy, no other religious system has this. So even if they were to go back to the religion, they don't know whether they are following the truth or not. Of course we know they are not following the truth. And the truth is based on evidences from the Islamic text and has no relation with those who adopt it or how many they are in number. This is how the Salaf viewed Islam and the Salaf means the generation of the Prophet and those came after them and followed them in that rightly guided path based on evidences. They deem that the truth does not come from any source except that of the Prophet They would never consider any religious claim 
which was not fully supported by strong evidences. Now one of the arguments that people make is, okay, you know, what's the harm in doing this? Okay, because not all people indulge in, you know, singing, dancing and these kind of things. Some people just stay on this day, they have marked this day and they narrate the seerah of the Prophet wasalam, the stories of the life of the Sahaba and things like that. You know, and want to teach people lessons from this. So what is the harm? Let us look at some of the harm that can come from this. First and foremost, this is an attempted worship of Allah in a way which the Prophet ﷺ did not legislate and by ways he did as misguided. So this is not done by the Prophet ﷺ. Remember, he said this is the criteria. And why is that the criteria? We'll see. Because when we try to do these kind of new practices, what we are really doing is Doubting the perfection and completion of the religion of Islam. If you remember, I narrated the ayah, Allah Akbar, So we are doubting that it is complete. We are doubting that it has been perfected. In our actions, we might not be saying it in our words, but in our actions, because otherwise, what is the need to do this new, mark this new day and to, you know, single it out? Doubting the honesty and sincerity of the Prophet perfectly conveying the message of Islam. Is that not a big enough harm? Because what we are saying by doing this practice, despite finding no evidence of this being done by the Prophet himself, is that now the villa may be forgotten. Or maybe this was given by Allah and he did not convey to us Allah. Doubting that the companions of the Prophet loved them because they did not celebrate his birthday. And one of our excuses is that we love the Prophet and this is an expression of our love. So if the and today there are many who will accuse those who don't celebrate as not loving the Prophet. And it's done in our parts of the world, many parts of the world, where people who don't celebrate they're accused of being not you know, lovers of the Prophet ﷺ. Another harm is this is imitating the Christians in the celebration that they hold for the birthday of Isa al Islam. A Sahabi, one of the scholars, claimed that if the people of the cross celebrated the night of the birthday of the Prophet, then the Muslims are worthier to celebrate and honor their Prophet. This is the argument. If other nations are celebrating the birthdays of the Prophets, then our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is more deserving of it. And that's why we do it. Mullah Ali Ali, another scholar, refuted him by saying, what answers a Sahabi is that, we Muslims were commanded to differ from the people of the book. If you read the Hadith of Rasulullah many places you will find there are certain instructions given to us, like I mentioned, the growing of the beard, trimming of the mustache. Prophet said, do it so that you are different from the Jews and the prior worshippers. In other uh, narrations, do this and be different from the Jews and Christians. Do this and be different from the Jews. So, Allah Ali Ali, the scholar is saying that if he is claiming that you know our Prophet deserves to be you know honored more because the Christians are honoring their Prophet, then in fact we should not be doing this because we have been commanded to be different from them, not to be like them. And some of the people have gone to the extent saying that the Prophet's birthday is better than the night of Al-Qadr. And this is a statement by one of the scholars named Al-Qaqtalani. But again, Mullah Al-Qadr, 
Manullah said, what Al-Astalani said is strange and unacceptable because Allah has told us about the virtue of the night of Al-Qadr in the Quran. Okay, uh, in the surah, Inna anzallahu fi laylatul qadr wa ma adraka ma laylatul qadr. Laylatul qadr khayrun min alfi shahar. The night of degree is better than a thousand months of worship. Yet there is no evidence in the Quran or the ahadith of such virtues being described for the birthday of the Prophet or in the Sunnah or by any of the Sahaba. And of course we find that during these celebrations people get carried away and there is usage of musical instruments. People recite the Quran, then after some time they transfer that to poetry and then this poetry starts bordering on the praise of, uh, beginning with the praise of Rasulullah and then to the extent that they raise him up to a status where it could be shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, joining him as a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like you will find in some of the books where I have personally read one of the books where it says in the big praise of Rasulullah it says that the earth surrounding the body of Rasulullah in the grave is more, how do you say, pure or, or is more honored than the Kaaba. So this is what happens when people go to extremes in expressing their love. And the Prophet forbade this. He said, do not Praise me like the previous generations, the Jews and the Christians praise their prophets, but call me the servant of Allah, Abdullah. Yeah? And he said also, Lanallahu Yahuda wa Nasara, ittafaza kubura ambiyahim masajira. May the curse of Allah be upon the Jews and the Christians who took the graves of the prophets as masajir. And there are many narrated, uh, fabricated and extremely weak ahadith are narrated on such occasions which are also condemned because fabricated ahadith or weak ahadith are condemned, uh, are false information which are presented as, you know, information coming from Rasulullah So this is lying on the Prophet And it is collected in Bukhari where Prophet said, He who narrates something on my behalf, suspecting that what he is saying might be a lie is one of the lies. In one of the other narrations, uh, I don't uh, remember the book where it is collected, but he said it is sufficient for the person to be a liar wherein he passes on information. I am paraphrasing, of course, these are not the exact words of the hadith, but where, he, uh, where it is reported that Rasulullah said it is sufficient for a person to be called a liar where he passes on information without verifying it. And also the Prophet said, Let he who intentionally and falsely attributes words to me expect his seat in the hellfire. So as we see dear brothers and sisters in Islam, that expressing our love, which is mandatory for the Prophet which is a part of our iman, which is a requirement, which is a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to love the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, indeed to love all the sahaba as well. But it is not through innovative practices, it is not for one day in a year. It is, we don't celebrate the birthday of the Prophet on one day. We celebrate his life every day. How do we do that? By absorbing his teachings in our life every day. By following his example every day not just one day in a year. So I ask Allah SWT to bless us and I wish uh, uh, with the guidance of the, Allah, uh, of the Quran and to benefit from its ayat and to give us the tawfiq to follow the straight path irrespective of the entire world following some other way. Allahumma aghfir lil muslimin wal muslimat wal mu'minin wal mu'minat wal ahya minhum wal amwat innaka samim mujib ad da'wat ibad Allah inna Allah ya'muru bil adl wal ihsan wa ita'id al qurba wa yanha 'anil fahsha'i wal munkari wal baghy ya'idukum la'allakum tadhakkarun wa qimsu